come with 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines, Lehman Company in 1967 and 68. Uh, I also served in the Kansas legislature for 14 years, and I live with my wife on a farm west of Lawrence. Uh, this program is about uh, taking John Musgrave back to Vietnam uh, and uh, to uh, the places where he was wounded in 1967. He served with uh, 1st Battalion, 9th Marines. Uh, he was wounded on the... Uh, in, in uh, August of 67 at a place called Balong Valley, which we visited, and on the, in October of 67 at uh, Contien, which was his, uh, which was his uh, battalion's uh, forward area. And then he was disabled, he wounded northwest of Contien on the 7th of November, 1967, uh, which at a, near where uh, we know as the uh, as the uh, agricultural experiment station. Uh, John was with 1-9. I met him about almost 40 years ago when a bunch of us Vietnam veterans got together. He told me that then that he was uh, a member of 1-9 as a rifleman, and he didn't have to tell me anything else. Uh, we operated with 1-9. I knew what he had done. I knew what he had been through, and uh, I knew that he was the real deal. Um, I was having lunch with he and uh, with him and uh, Professor Tuttle one day, and uh, I asked John if he had any interest in going back to Vietnam, and uh, he said that he did. There were many that were expressed concern about him going back to Vietnam. I thought it would trigger bad memories or something, but John was anxious to go back, and uh, so Lindsay will talk a little bit about how that uh, came to pass. I asked him what he wanted to see, and he said he wanted to go back to the places where he was wounded and also to the site of Operation Buffalo, which took place on the 2nd of uh, uh, July of 1967, where, uh, which turned out to be the deadliest day for a Marine Corps battalion in Marine Corps history. history. Uh, and uh, uh, a Navy corpsman with 3-3 uh, downloaded the after-action reports, the unit diaries, and the command chronologies for 1-9 Bravo Company, which was John's company, uh, for the dates that he was wounded and for the date of the Operation Buffalo. And uh, that gave us a six-digit map coordinates, which uh, would tell us exactly where John was when he was wounded and, and where Operation Buffalo took place. And we used those uh, six digit coordinates and the topographical maps. Lindsay will show you a picture of one later on to find the, ex the exact locations of uh, where John wanted to visit. But in going back to Vietnam, we traversed the whole country. We started in Hanoi and spent some time in the Central Highlands where we fought in 1967 and then uh, ended up in, uh, went to Hue and then ended up in uh, Saigon. Uh, let me introduce uh, the other uh, panelists here. Now, Bill, uh, Professor Tuttle has a long, long uh, biography, and he has uh, sent me two sentences, which I will read. But uh, believe me, this is not uh, the sum and substance of everything that we could say about him. Uh, Bill Tuttle is a, pr a professor emeritus of American studies at the University of Kansas. He's an Air Force veteran of the Vietnam era, having served as a training officer with the 4038 bomb wing stationed in the United States. Lindsay Fout spent 10 years working as a reporter, producer, and community engagement expert at Kansas City PBS. She led the station's content and engagement efforts focused on veterans, including award-winning local documentary and innovative engagement initiatives for Ken Burns and Lynn Novak's The Vietnam War. Through that work, she was uh, lucky to work with and befriend John Musgrave and join him on the return trip to Vietnam. Currently, Lindsay is the content and communications director at Rabbit Hole, which is an immersive museum for children's literature. Uh, John Musgrave, which is what this program is really about, was born and raised in Missouri. He enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1966. He served most notably in the 3rd Battalion, in the 3rd Marine Division, 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, Bravo Company, 
and was disabled wounded on the 7th of November, 1967, and medically retired from the Marine Corps. He is a graduate of Ottawa University. He just completed a book with a working title, The Education of Cor Corporal John Musgrave, public, published by the uh, Knopf Publishing Company. He was prominently featured in Ken Burns' documentary on Vietnam. And John's son, who was a photographer who accompanied us on this trip, is an educator and uh, he's currently working at the University of Miami in Florida. Uh, also with us on the trip was his mother and John's wife, Shannon, but she's not with us on, on for this program, but she, uh, she was a valuable member of our group. And with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Professor Tuttle. Thank you, John. It's really an honor for me to introduce John Musgrave. Uh, I came to KU in 1967 to teach in the history department and immediately became involved in the anti-war movement. I had, I had been a veteran myself and I think there's a photo that we might share with you of my time in the Air Force. I spent three years in the Air Force as a training officer for a bomb wing, but again, most of it in the continental United States, a couple DDYs overseas, but mostly right here in the US. Again, coming to KU in 1967, I had supported the war, I think up until about 1966, when I heard uh, George Kennan, the father of the containment policy that the US followed for years, saying he thought the war was a mistake, that he thought it was immoral, unconstitutional, illegal, and maybe mostly unwise to fight against the war for national liberation. He thought we would lose for sure. And of course he was correct. So when I came out to KU in 67, I was uh, ready to oppose the war uh, more actively. John Musgrave, as some of you know, is known locally at least, and I think nationally at this point, is a hero, a Marine, rifleman, poet, and again, to those who know him, especially locally, a hero. As John Solbach said at age 17, and with his parents' consent, John Musgrave enlisted in the US Marine Corps. It was 1966, and the war in Vietnam had dramatically escalated. John, who was a rifleman, was wounded in combat, the last time so grievously that he was airlifted to a military hospital and eventually sent home. At every step along the way, the medical people were convinced that he would die, but he didn't. He's a very strong, courageous man. So he came home. Uh, in addition to his three Purple Hearts, John was awarded the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry with the Gold Star. And back home, again in the US, he became an activist with the Vietnam veterans against the war. And here he is pictured in 1972 at KU, protesting against the war during the Kansas relays. But John was known not only locally as an anti-war activist, he was known nationally. He became a national leader of the Vietnam veterans. And also he began to write poetry. As many of you know, these are powerful poems. They recount the combat horrors of Vietnam. I don't know if you can see this, but this is the... Uh, I think I hit the keyboard. But this is the book called Notes to the Man Who Shot Me, Vietnam War Poems. You really ought to pick up a copy and read it. It is so powerful and so important, frankly. These poems tell of a young warrior who left his innocent as well as his blood on the battlefield, the battlefields that we visited in Vietnam. But also they tell of a wise patriot who demands that America honor both its ideals and those troops have, who have defended them. We live in troubled times, as we all know. And these poems, John's poems, speak truth to the illusions being spun in favor of America. So it's a great pleasure for me at this point to introduce my comrade, my brother, John Musgrave. Okay, we're, we're going to go to Lindsay first before we go to John. Go ahead, Lindsay. Okay. Um, so um, I came into the picture um, because of this PBS series and the work I was doing at the local station. Um, it's almost three years to the day that um, I mean, many people already knew John Musgrave because of his, his anti-war work, but the wider world got to know um, John Musgrave because uh, Ken Burns and Lynn Novick's uh, series 
had begun airing um, on television um, across across the world. And um, if I hope many of you who are watching have have watched the series, and and if you have, you know that um, John's contributions are so incredibly powerful. In part, just because of the um, the journey he shares with us, from um, the reasons he joined the Marines to um, his realization that that um, the war was wrong and fighting against it. And um, it's for those reasons, likely Ken Burns said in a, in a Vanity Fair article um, that he had this reoccurring thought that if some evil genie took away all their interviews for the series, um, which I think they did close to a hundred uh, and he could just keep one, it would be John's that he would keep. Um, and, and he would call that film the, the education of, of John Musgrave. Um, so locally in Kansas City, um, around the series, we produce local content and we were lucky enough that um, Ken Burns and Lynn Novick actually came to Kansas City for a special event um, that we did at the Midland Theater uh, with nearly 2000 people. And both John and Dr. James Wilbanks, um, who is a fellow veteran and was also in the series, joined them on stage to, to talk about the film. Um, but it actually was a slightly smaller event um, in Lawrence, Kansas at Liberty Hall um, that helped uh, start some, some of this journey for all of us. Um, it was a totally packed theater, like 800 people. Um, and we showed clips of the series and content we produced locally with, with John um, and about veterans in our region. And uh, during the Q&A uh, portion, somebody asked John, you know, do you want to go back to Vietnam or have you ever had the desire to? And John said, you know, yes, I would love to go back, um, but financially it's never been, been in the cards for me. Um, and it was shortly after that event that um, some friends of John's launched a GoFundMe to uh, send John and Shannon um, on a trip back to Vietnam. Um, and I was lucky enough that they invited me to come with them. Uh, and um, there was a, a period of time when we had hoped to fully document and film John's return um, as a full documentary. Um, but the Vietnamese government denied our press credentials. So we weren't able to um, film and document it in the way um, we wanted to. But lucky for us, um, Dan Musgrave is a super talented photographer and you're gonna see now his photos um, and he'll talk through them with, with John, uh, um, some highlights from the trip. Okay, uh, John is going to, are, are you ready for John now, Lindsay? Yes. Okay, I just want to mention that uh, if you have questions, you can type them in on the YouTube and uh, Lindsay will moderate the, get the questions to us at the end of the uh, program. And now uh, John Musgrave and his son Daniel will uh, talk about uh, uh, their perspective of the trip. John, go ahead. Uh, it was extraordinary. Uh, not only to have the opportunity to go back to Vietnam, something that I thought I would never do, but to be able to go with true and trusted friends was just a privilege. Uh, the GoFundMe page became uh, a reality when uh, David Han and Rose Marino uh, here in Lawrence, David's a Marine Vietnam vet, uh, initiated the GoFundMe uh, page and uh, people from all over the world donated uh, for us to be able to return. And uh, it was a very humbling experience in and of itself. For most of my years, uh, I didn't think I'd ever want to see Vietnam again. Um, but it was after the series came out, after working with Ken and Lynn, and they interviewed some North Vietnamese soldiers in the series that had fought against my unit. And uh, I'd been dreaming about these guys almost every night since I came home and they were always the same age and 
they terrified me and I just didn't think I wanted to face th that until I saw in the series that they were old men just like me. They were talking about their buddies. They were talking about combat the way I would if, if I was talking to my my buddies. And, and I realized that uh, we had a lot more in common with each other than we did with the men who sent us to kill each other. And that's when I realized I really would like to go back to Vietnam, especially if I could sit down with some of those men that I had fought against and declare my own personal ceasefire. To walk that ground with my wife and my son was uh, it's I'm sorry it's I wish I could explain to you what it felt like to see my son standing in places where I had been terrified. and where I had to fight for my life. And how comforting it was to have he and my wife there and my three close, close friends, all of whom I knew were worried about me. And, and I was worried about them. Um, Bub, Daniel, do we would you like to step in here? Yeah, sure. Uh, so everybody's going to have to forgive us. Like, this is the first time I've actually seen my dad since December, given how 2020 has played out. Uh, so if we digress, just forgive us and kind of corral us back in. <laughs> uh, yeah, going back, or for me, going for the first time, it was very important, you know, the whole world basically knows John Musgrave, the Marine, but that's a separate person than John Musgrave, the dad, or just dad. Uh, so, you know, basically it's been a three plus decade journey to figure out how those two people align and to figure out how one could be the other. Uh, my dad's gentle. My dad cares for sick and stray cats. <laughs> uh, but the Marine was a Marine, right? So getting to go there with him, uh, it's, it's the beginning of or at least a continuation of understanding that that whole person. Um, so, Dad, we saw a few photos kind of from the first couple days uh, up in Hanoi. You know, you talked about wanting to meet these other men, but even before we got there, there was questions about this trip, right? you had some some concerns about making it out of the airport. So so what was it like to be in Hanoi? Well, we weren't sure if the uh, North Vietnamese government was was going to let me in. Uh, there was a they were not uh, pleased with the documentary and there wasn't anything they could do to Kinner Lin but I was a symbol of the documentary and they had ordered those North Vietnamese soldiers I had looked so forward to, to meeting and embracing not to speak with me specifically. So we literally weren't sure uh, when we arrived in Hanoi if they would honor my visa, uh, but they did. 
and uh, think of myself uh, in the my enemy's capital and the place where so many Americans had suffered and died as prisoners of war and air crew. Uh, I had trouble because I, I was like slipping in and out of, of uh, my time. My, your gut gets a vote in this and my gut has uh, different feelings about Vietnam than my mind does now. And there's a, a conflict between the two on occasion. But to walk through the Hanoi Hilton with my son, and to walk the ground where the man who he is named after helped save my life. I was just, uh, so cognizant of the fact that had they not have saved me, my son wouldn't be there with me and I wouldn't have my other children. So whenever you hear somebody talking about being saved, they're not only being saved, their children are being saved, their grandchildren are being saved, and everything their children do and their grandchildren and great-grandchildren do for this country is because of those people, Dan Cooney and Jim Rye specifically, who risked death to drag me out of that ambush, even though they knew I was dying. So our trip really kind of started nice and easy uh, in Hanoi. We got to walk through the city, um, saw this monument to, or I'm not sure if it's a monument, but uh, this little statue commemorating uh, John McCain falling from the sky. Uh, we went to several museums and met a lot of like really nice people, really engaged people. Many people who had already seen the documentary and recognized you even in the middle of Hanoi. Um, did that help prepare you for the, the heavier parts of the trip to just settle in a little bit? Did it help put you back in the present at least a little? Yes, yes, and it did. You're, you're very right. I just had no idea what it was going to be like to be at Kantian and at the, at the ambush site. I, I, I was so glad that you and Shannon were with me and because I I needed your presence to keep me grounded. My wife, it was, did not realize how much the trip was going to impact her personally until we got to Saigon because Vietnam took up two years of her life as a child when her father was in Vietnam for two different tours. So it became a family experience in, in, in different, many different ways. As, as someone who grew up in a veteran's house you know was raised by a veteran like that's something that doesn't often make it into the pamphlets or the commercials or 
a lot of the common value when we talk about the war it's it's the thing that happened over there uh but war doesn't stop when people come home you know so it's very easy to uh sympathize and empathize mm -hmm. with, with that I've included some pictures of, of Balong, uh, not Balong, really. Uh, what am, How what Long am I Bay. Saying? How Long Bay, sorry, geez. Uh, this is the second place that we went after Hanoi. And it was a really beautiful spot. It's a, a very uh, popular tourist destination, but uh, I thought it was interesting how dad could interact and find animals wherever he went, animals that were drawn to him, uh, animals that asked him for attention and care. Um, but again, uh, the bay and the, the karst formations there, I thought were a really nice start to the trip. How, uh, how are you preparing yourself at this point? You know that it's the next stop. Are you, how are you preparing yourself mentally and emotionally to step foot again on that ground? I had to make it a mission. I just had to set my mind that I was, uh, this was a mission I was on, and that's a mission I had to complete. I was, I was worried about how I was going to feel when I got to places where I had literally lived. Uh, and I was very conscious of the fact that everybody else was worried too. <laughs> And uh, uh, John, thank you so much for putting Holland Bay in our trip because that was just an extraordinary experience and I needed that time. I really did. And, uh, I don't think any of you realized how much I was leaning on all of you uh, throughout the trip. Uh, because it, it was just like you were in my squad. I trusted all of you with my feelings, with my weaknesses, with my passion. But I was really, really sweating bullets uh, about going back to Kantian. But John, you insisted we go back there twice. Yes, you bet. <laughs> and I, I, I hope I get to go back again. Uh, for one thing, it doesn't look anything like I remembered it. No. We we turned that place into the look like the moon. With all the airstrikes, there wasn't a bomb crater visible anywhere. The, the area in which I was shot that we found was a big open field. Uh, that was heavy, heavy jungle the day I, that we were ambushed and I was shot. A friend of mine had warned me before I left and I didn't really understand what she meant. She said, be prepared to mourn for your Vietnam. And I thought, well, that's I don't want, okay, I don't get what she meant, but when I got there, I did understand it because it did not look like my Vietnam. And there were parts of me that really wanted it to. Uh, so that it would be real. 
it was difficult to, in that quiet, peaceful place, thank God, it was difficult to align that with my memories. And to remember where I had lain after I was shot in the chest and made my peace with God and thought that this is the ground on which my existence would end. To walk there all those years later as an old man, what a privilege. To be able to see that place that was literally hell on earth for us in the Marine Corps, when you got the word that you were going to Contien, you just felt like you were getting issued a death warrant. To now see it so beautiful and so peaceful and so quiet. so worthy of the sacrifice of all the young men on both sides who fought for it. I'm still trying to process it all. <clears throat> My son and I have a dream that we're gonna to get to go back again and, and Daniel's going to write a book. He's a, My son, by the way, is an award-winning writer, and I am very proud of him. This is what I warned you all about, saying that we haven't seen each other since December. <laughs> I miss him. So I remember that first trip to Contien, and, and you know, it was maybe 100% humidity, and yet the, the tension coming off of you, Dad, was just as thick. Um, sometimes I remember you saying that, you know, that that war was was cursed. If you try to touch it, you try to get involved with it, it's it's gonna have an impact on you, a negative one. Uh, was that kind of fear running through your head? as we got out of the van? Yes, for you and Shannon in particular. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I don't know how to explain it, son. Well, we got out of that van and I remember we took maybe, we got 200, meters away and then that landmine went off in the field yeah. Yeah. and you know it had already been quiet before that but then it was dead silent after and there's a plume of smoke rising up out of this field that we were just standing in just being warned about you know, there are still mines here. This ground is still dangerous. Five decades later, it still has something to say. It still remembers. And then it explodes and I could, I could see how big of an impact that had on you. I guess I don't really have a question about that, but I feel like it's an important part of the story. Yeah, we, I had just told you the story of a, a three man listening post who got lost going out through the wire at night at Contien and walked right in front of my hole before they stepped on a mine and it blew up in front of my hole. And I just got done telling you that story and saying there's nothing sounds like a landmine. They're, they have their own unique sound and there's always dead silence after the landmine goes off. 
before the screaming starts. And I felt like I was hanging by my hang fingernails from some precipice after that thing went off, waiting for the screams. But we were reassured by the people around us that they had command detonated that mine. No one had stepped on it. But it was sure putting an ex explanation point on, on our presence there. Yeah. So I think maybe more than anything, having that announce our arrival, uh, it made it so hard to be there that first time. It was like we couldn't we couldn't really get into Conti and we couldn't really get into the ambush point because who knows around us, right? Right. And then we had the extremely difficult <laughs> task of going to the marketplace. Yeah. Is there anything that you want to tell folks about that so they understand just how how heavy? The marketplace was uh, to the northeast of Contien, just south of the demilitarized zone. On Sunday morning, the 2nd of July, 1967, uh, the North Vietnamese ambushed two companies from my battalion uh, in two separate places. And Bravo Company was at the marketplace and they slaughtered almost every man in Bravo Company. And all we had to send out to help was one platoon of Marines on the back of four tanks. And it was my platoon. And we were going out to where we knew a regiment was massacring a Marine infantry company. And I was so proud to be with those teenage kids who didn't hesitate to climb up on the backs of those tanks to go out to what we were sure would be our deaths because Marines don't leave their buddies. And if we were all there was to send, we were gonna go. I, it doesn't mean we weren't terrified, we were. But nobody hesitated. This little man in this picture, when he came up to me, I saluted him. And he returned a colonial salute I think that he was probably in the uh, South Vietnamese army when the French were still there. A very gentle little man standing in a place of absolute horror and anxious to help in any way that he could. You, you couldn't help it, your heart couldn't help but reach out to, to these people because they were kind, because they were so, so very kind. Something that struck me that day, that first day, um, was how close everything was. Yeah. Because you hear stories and you think of something you see on TV where they have to ride horses for three days to get to the from the base to the battlefield. But this seemed like it all happened in, you know, we're from Baldwin, the few blocks around our house. Yes. And it really drove home the way that you know, combat can play with our perceptions. Every step in a dangerous place, a place where any step could be your last, makes that space exponentially larger. 
Yes. And I think about the fact that you heard that battle at the marketplace, like you heard it. Yeah. And it was within reach. Yeah. It was like a neighborhood, <laughs> you know. And when the fights were real close, we didn't call them firefights, we called them brawls. And in that, the North Vietnamese Army slogan was, when you fight the Americans, hang on to their belts. So they were always very close to us if they initiated the fight. And that just adds a whole new layer of horror to combat to be so close to one another. But when I was thinking of all my buddies that were killed up there, how privileged I was there to remember them. Tell them it was okay now. The I'm going to interrupt yeah. here just a second. The smoke that you see in that picture uh, is from uh, debris that they're burning. They tore out a uh, yeah. rubber plantation that uh, uh, and they're replanting those rubber trees, and that's where the smoke comes from. But in the process of digging trenches to plant new rubber tr trees, just a few weeks before we got there, they unearthed about 37 NVA soldiers' bodies that were probably there from the 2nd of uh, July of 1967. I'd be willing to bet that. They're still finding their MIs too. <clears throat> so the next day, we went quite a ways to get to Balong Valley. Can you tell us a little bit about what that place means to you and, and why it was really important to go there? Uh, the Balong Valley is where we went after Operation Buffalo. And it was just our company in this big valley, cut through the middle with the big river. And uh, we were running reconnaissance patrols constantly. On top of the highest mountain, there was a position we called Tea Party One because that was the radio call sign we would rotate squads on that mountaintop uh, for our reconnaissance teams that were on one side of the mountain, their call radio calls for help couldn't get over the mountain. So we had to be on top of the mountain to intercept their calls and then relay those calls to the other side of the mountain. And it was called a radio relay station. And the NVA came and tried to take it one night, and that's where I was wounded the first time. How did it feel to get there and see all these fairly modern houses? And you could see through the front window, and the kids were watching cartoons on satellite TV. It blew my mind. Uh, <laughs> It's literally like I had one foot in different worlds. Uh, but it was also beautiful not to hear any gunshots, uh, not to hear anybody screaming. That when we saw kids, they weren't terrified of us. Uh, 
People always smiled at us. Nobody was mad at me. And then something would happen, a smell or a sound that would snap me right back to 1967. It just, it made it real clear to me that I'm still, I'm still working through things that happened to me when I was 18 and 19 years old. And I'm 72 now. <laughs> We got to return to Kantian after that. Uh, what what made the second visit easier? What what kind of shift in your thinking helped? Cut the first time I was shocked by what I saw. Well, or let me rephrase it: I was shocked by what I didn't see. And going back the next day, I knew what to expect. And I had that out of the way. So I was able to concentrate on being there in the moment. I, I wasn't stepping back and forth the second time we went up. Was it still a mission? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it'll... It'll always be a mission. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, all my buddies are still alive in me. And uh, the second day I felt I felt closer to them. It's almost like they were walking with me to make sure I was okay. And to tell me that they were okay. So the second day was real important and, and helped me a lot. I could I could feel a lifting. And we have a, at least one photo from that uh, war cemetery. Just you were lighter. To see all those graves, that's the North Vietnamese Army Cemetery. I wanted to go there and pay my respects. Because I know how scared they were. And I know what they gave up. And I know I was responsible for some of them being there. And that was right in the middle of the demilitarized zone, a place we had to shoot our way into and shoot our way out of. And now there's a national cemetery for the North Vietnamese soldiers. And they are all over North and South Vietnam. They lost so many people in that war, that long continuous war that literally lasted well over a hundred years. They were fighting the French, then they were fighting the Japanese, 
Then they were fighting the French and the Japanese. Then they were fighting us. And then they fought the Chinese. I've been to Arlington with you in one of our trips to DC. How is this cemetery, was it surprising at all? Uh, I know that each of these large graves, if I'm remembering correctly, is a mass grave dedicated to martyrs um, in the war for independence. Like, did the quantity of unknown graves unnerve you or how did, how do you how did that experience compare to going to you know an American war cemetery? I, it was a much more personal. Uh, the respect and then the emotion were very similar, but uh, this would be like how, how I felt when I was at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Arlington. John, would you like to go to Lindsay and see if she's got any questions for us? Oh, sure, sure, you bet. Well, maybe um, we can give people a minute to, to think of questions. Um, so we just have a little bit of time left, but there are a few photos left. Daniel and John, do you want to? Sure, um, go ahead. I think the rest of it is is kind of the wind down, the kind of denouement of the of the trip. You know, we, we visited Way, we met uh, a really charming Brit, uh, who was also a U.S. Marine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we went to this room where they planned uh, the war. I think I think Ho Chi Minh was here. They it's planned an, uh, the attack on the U.S. Embassy in Teta 68 in that room. Okay. Yeah. So that's on top of a noodle shop where we ate lunch. Yeah. It was it was great. First time I've ever seen my dad drink a beer, at least that I can remember. And I did that for your Uncle Jay. Because he, when he couldn't go with us, he told me to drink a, a that was called tiger piss beer. That's what we called it. And uh, so I, I promised him I'd drink one for him. So I, I did. And I had to have proof. So that's why the photo of me holding up the bottle. Have had one since. Yeah, so that's it. So I, you know, just to make sure everybody knows, watching, you are able to submit questions to the chat on YouTube, and we will uh, handle those. Anything that you want to know, uh, we're on it. Yeah. So um, one question from uh, Frank Jansen. He wants to know, can you say how you were received by the Vietnamese people? John, you want to take that? Sure. Uh, there's a picture that uh, was earlier shown of John Musgrave at the Hanoi Hilton. And if you look at those uh, uh, representations there on the wall of uh, Vietnamese in the French prison, uh, the uh, the Vietnamese people love Americans and they have since we opened up trade with them in uh, 1995, but they still hate the French. <laughs> and the Chinese. Yeah, the Chinese. But I, I, think, I thought the people were very warm and, and uh, accepting of us. And uh, but they did want us to buy their t-shirts, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and uh, here is a, another question. If you were to return to Vietnam again, are there any places you would want to go that you didn't visit in this first trip? Yes, I'd like to go to Da Nang. 
Uh, that's where I first arrived in Vietnam and I served for a few months down there in an area that was called the Da Nang East Compound, um, down around Mar Marble Mountain. Uh, so I would love to see that again. And I would love to go back to Kantian and, and uh, the Balong again. I could, I could go there a lot of times. Well, and it would be nice too to actually, if we could coordinate you meeting some of the, the men that you were fighting uh, and some of the early pictures that we showed of Daniels um, when we were still in Hanoi, there's a man that we're sitting at a table with and that John has his arm around at one point. And um, that's Wa, who was actually Ken and Lin's uh, producer there in Vietnam. And um, he was our connection to hopefully meet with um, those North Vietnamese veterans and was also the one to communicate to us that the government had told them not to meet, meet with us, um, but we were able to spend some time with him in Hanoi. Uh, there's another question. Mm -hmm. Sarah Thompson asks, uh, when was your trip back to Vietnam? Also, thanks so much for sharing the trip and your thoughts, John, Daniel, and everyone. Uh, it was 2017, right? 2018, That's when the series came, 2018. Yeah. Oh, it was 2018? October of 2018. <clears throat> okay. Um, Mark Crabtree asks, Dan and John, do you feel that your mission as part of your closure also creates some closure for other um, military people, military families who follow your journey? Well, that's a tough question. Uh, I know that uh, the people that I know that have worried about me all these years as I've struggled with these memories, uh, I know my returning was important to them. And that, that was humbling. I would like to think that uh, if any Vietnam veterans were listening to this and were questioning whether or not they should return that that uh, I'm portraying this in a positive light so that they'll, uh, if they're given the opportunity that they'll go, I, I'm so grateful I had that opportunity. And I, and I like I said, I would love to go back. Um, question from uh, Dennis Dahmer. She said, thank you so much for this very moving chat. I'm curious about Ho Chi Minh City. Did it feel different than Hanoi? Bill? Well, it's interesting because I think they both were just overwhelming in their own, in their own way. There were so many people there. There was so much activity, so many people on mopeds and motorcycles. Uh, this is the modern world. I don't know what it was like in 1967, but we're clearly in 2021 right now. And it's uh, if you, very lively places. If you look at Hanoi from uh, a distance, it looks, the skyline looks like New York City. Uh, the, I found the people in Hanoi to be a little bit more closed and uh, not as open as the people in uh, Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, and of course, that's its official name, but many of us still call it Saigon. The, uh, the people, uh, you can tell a lot of difference, I think, between uh, the people in the north and the people in the south. Yes, I think that's true. One reason I went back was I have two students, doctoral students at American Studies at KU from Vietnam, one from Hanoi and one from Hue. And th those cities were different as well from each other. But it was wonderful to go back. And as John said, both Johns, the Vietnamese people were just marvelously welcoming. They were happy to see us and we, and we adored them. It, for me, this was one of, one of the great privileges I've ever had. And that was accompanying both John Musgrave and John Solbach back to Vietnam. When I decided to go, uh, and John Musgrave heard about this, he wrote me a wonderful, wonderful note, which I might share real quickly. I've been meaning to write you since John Solbach told me you'd be joining us for our return to Vietnam. I'm afraid I can't adequately, adequately express what this means to me. 
we've known each other for many years, and I've always felt lucky to have you as a friend. Since Vietnam is what started our friendship in those difficult days of the peace movement, to share this experience is fitting. I'm looking forward to showing you the ground we bled for. And again, thank you both so much for inviting me. It was a marvelous, marvelous trip, one I'll never forget. And I'd like to go back as well. All right. It's great to have you as part of the group. Thanks. We have another question um, from Tamsin Brown asks, was there ever a sense there in country of pre-American Vietnam? Or were there any places where we felt like, um, you know, weren't totally changed by the war? I think that's what they're asking. We have to understand that for John Solbach and I, our first experience was uh, basically in that neighborhood up north, as, you, as Daniel has pointed out, there's not a whole lot of ground there to cover. Uh, so we didn't see much of, of the real Vietnam. Uh, we just saw the war Vietnam. Uh, so I didn't have anything to compare it to. Uh, John, what do you think? Ben? When I when uh, this was my third trip back to Vietnam, I went back uh, first on a trip planned by John Ripley, our former company commander, and the second time we were invited by the security staff at the U.S. Embassy in Hanoi to the Marine Corps birthday ball. Uh, the first trip about uh, in 2009, I think, uh, uh, there was a lot more uh, poverty. Uh, there, there were still uh, children who weren't in school. Uh, today, everybody wears a school uniform. Everybody's got a bicycle or a moped or even an automobile. All the kids are in school. Everybody's got a little bit of money. Uh, people have jobs. It's a lot different today than, than it used to be. Pre, uh, Pre-American, it would have been a very, very rural uh, area. And it's uh, the they wouldn't have had cell phones. I mean, in Kalu, where we were for a while, they now have internet cafes, which <laughs> is amazing to me. But uh, I didn't see anything that uh, would look like uh, pre-American Vietnam. Um, question from Charles Crabtree: How did your feelings and emotions change once you returned home? From the war the first time? I think Charles means from the trip. Well, uh, it answered a lot of questions for me. Uh, and I, I left a lot of fear there. I realized there was that I had a I had a say in the matter. And that it, it, it was time my buddies wouldn't want me to carry that hate and that terror. And it was okay for me to, to let it go. And, and I honest to God, I'm still processing it. Uh, but it, there was not one the only negative thing, there was one negative thing, and that was the government's interference in, in warriors being able to embrace one another who had fought one another and, and express their, their happiness to see the other has survived. I, I feel like I was cheated of that. And I hope I'll get an opportunity to do that other than that, everything that happened on that trip was just out of this world positive. And I, again, I can't express how fortunate I was that I was surrounded with people that I loved and trusted. So. So it looks like there aren't um, any further questions in the chat. I don't know, do any of you have final thoughts you want to conclude with? 
Well, of course, it, 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 at this period of our history, we're always talking about, uh, Kevin Wilmot calls him King Tang, but our current president, it's clear after having made this trip, and of course serving in the military myself, that um, we weren't losers or suckers. These were very brave people, many of them making incredible sacrifices to defend their country, to defend our ideals, and it's actually disgraceful to have, to have viewed them in any different way. These are brave, courageous people. Okay. I'll add one more thing if we've got time then. So I'm a, I'm a college professor now, I teach freshmen. The kids that are coming into my class are 18 and they've never known a United States at peace, not once in their life. That's right. And, you know, one of the early questions said, you know, does this mission help create closure? There's a whole new generation of mission that is going to need to happen. Um, I don't think that I'm an example for anybody. I'm a civilian. My dad's a good example, though. Uh, he speaks candidly. He speaks honestly. And he never wanted me to get a false idea of what he did or, or what he was a part of. And I think we're going to have to have a lot of discussions like that moving forward. We can't close down and shut off. Dialogue in our future is going to be necessary, uh, probably to our very survival. So I just encourage you all to speak freely with one another and, you know, trust each other. Amen. Amen. Good one, Bob. Lindsay, thank you for all of your questions and your moderating. And John and uh, and Daniel, thank you. And, and Professor Tuttle, thank you for joining us and going with us on the trip. It was good to have you there with us. It was a privilege for all to be with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and thanks to the Dole Institute for for bringing us together this afternoon to, to talk you about bet. it. You bet. Yes. Okay. Does that conclude our program then? I believe so. Okay. Good Daniel. to see you all. Daniel, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still there. Uh, we got a dog last night. Oh, <laughs> that's he new. looks like Maynard with long legs. Oh, thank goodness! It's a Chihuahua mix, black and white. Sounds like a monster. He's he's Shannon's dog already, so that she needed this. But we'll send you a picture. Okay, please do. Yeah, and I'll I'll try to make it down. You know, by 2021. You know. Yeah. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah.